you could open your Bibles if you have them with you. We're going to look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And today we celebrate Resurrection Day, Easter. And uh, all around the world, uh, people are celebrating about Jesus rising again from the dead. And that's one of the, the crux of Christianity, really, is an empty tomb. But a lot of folks today are wondering about Easter in general, about Jesus for that matter. A lot of folks would say, you know, uh, Christianity was great at the time, but we've evolved as a culture. And uh, back in those days, they were superstitious, but we've moved on since then. People say that Jesus was a great moral teacher, that we like what he spoke about. We can learn from him, taking care of the poor and helping the old ladies cross the street and all that kind of stuff. We, we like that part about Christianity. But this whole thing about him being God, well, we're not quite sure about that. Uh, other folks would say, you know, uh, we believe that Jesus didn't necessarily rise from the dead. But even more powerful is the fact that the spirit of Christ rose again from the dead, which is powerful. So God wants to resurrect your, your marriage, wants to resurrect all kinds of things in your life. And you can learn from the life of Christ. But he didn't really, you know raised from the dead. We tell the kids that, but you know, later on, we're going to find out later on, like Peter Pan and, and Tooth the Tooth Fairy and all that kind of stuff. It's not really true, but we, we believe it. We think it's great as far as the philosophy is concerned. We have Buddhism, we have Confucianism, we have Islam, we have atheism, we have all these different types of religions, and you know what? It's all Hinduism. All of it's pretty much, all have a piece of the truth, and so we, because we're sophisticated New Englanders, we know how to go about and pick and get all the truth, and we, as a result of looking at all these world religions, we're not so small-minded to stay only in Christianity or only in Islam or Hinduism. We want to just kind of spread abroad and understand that the world is bigger than our little world, and we want to become more educated and more cultured people. And it sounds just wonderful. And I would say uh, that, is a per that is a growing phenomena we see within the confines of America and across Europe as well. People are saying, we're not quite sure about all this. And so, but what, is, what did Jesus actually say about himself? And, and what's the big deal about resurrection? Did it really happen? Truth of the matter is, we believe here at Cornerstone, and I believe as well, that Jesus indeed did rise again from the dead. Well, what evidence is there? I mean, come on. I, I mean, some of you heard of Johnny Appleseed. I had a friend of mine in graduate school. His great-great-great-grandfather was supposedly was Johnny, Johnny Appleseed. And Johnny Appleseed went around the United States and planted apple trees, and that's why we have Connecticut. <laughs> And treasure. But, you know, it was kind of a tall tale. And first he planted some trees and then it got bigger. How about Paul Bunyan or, or somebody? It used to be four foot six. And we have, a, we have a little line of people, about 20 people we line up. And by the end of the 20th person, the four foot six person is 10 foot eight and is a lumberjack. So you really can't trust the word of mouth. You really can't trust uh, tradition. And what basically happened was this. Jesus was a great moral teacher. He died. He didn't rise again from the dead, but his disciples say they did. And basically, they began to embellish, 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 kind of like the mythical figures of Greek, Thor and all that kind of stuff. And really, we should have a superhero movie about Jesus like we are with the Avengers. So, you know, they start thinking that way. Well, what does the Bible really say? And, and is Christianity really true? If it's not true, and did he really rise again from the dead? I think those are good questions to ask. And so we're going to look at it today. We're going to look at it from a person by the name of the Apostle Paul who was originally named Saul, and he was a religious uh, Pharisee, and he was very well educated. He be, went, went to an Ivy League of his day. He studied under the best teacher of the time, Gamaliel. He was an amazing, philosophical, intelligent man, and he devoted his life to the study of the Old Testament. And when the, uh, th what happened with the Christianity began to spread, he was really against it because he thought it was a cult. It was threatening the integrity of Judaism. And so what he did is he went on a crusade to help arrest and help round up and even see them executed as Christians. But something extraordinary happened to the Apostle Paul. He was on his way to Damascus. As he was on his way to Damascus, a great light shone from heaven and blinded him. And he heard, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Who is this? This is the Lord Jesus Christ. The Apostle Paul then, for 13 years, we didn't hear about him for a number of years, and then later on he came out, and he ended up being one of the greatest missionaries that the world has ever seen. He's written uh, about a third of the New Testament, and he writes this book called 1 Corinthians, if you want to turn there. And in this Corinthian, it's about 20 years after the death and resurrection of Christ. The church is pretty, pretty well established, but it has problems. And something that crept into the church was the, the church in Corinth had a lot of different religions 
that were also simultaneously being practiced all around. They had, they had temple prostitutes, they had Zeus, they had all these different, the goddess Diana, they had all these different religions, and Christianity was one of many. And, but this church was rising up. And the crux of Christianity was the fact that Christ rose again from the dead. And there were people in the church that were saying, well, we don't think necessarily we're going to rise from the dead. So the Apostle Paul is addressing this church that is going a little wayward and trying to help them to understand who they are in Christ. And it's just so great that we can read this today because he really deals with the question, how do we know that Christianity is true? And so we're going to look at it here in a few moments. If you could open your Bibles or follow along on the screen or your electronic device. Um, 1 Corinthians 15. I'm going to be reading from the New Living Translation, which is a good translation. It's more than modern English, and uh, it, it does a good job of translating. We'll go ahead and read it right now, starting at verse 1, 1 Corinthians 15. Let me now remind you, dear brothers and sisters, of the good news I preached to you before. Do you know what good news means? Good news means gospel. So, so I believe in the gospel. It really should be, I believe in good news. Because that's what the gospel is. Why is there good news? There'd be no good, good news without bad news, which we'll get into a little later. Of the good news I preached to you before, you welcomed it then, and you still, term, you still stand firm in it. Verse 2, it is the good news that saves you if you continue to believe the message I told you. Unless, of course, you believe something that was never true in the first place. I passed on to you, which is important, which has also been passed on to me, that Christ died for our sins just as the Scriptures said. Now, that's amazing. It says, just as the Scriptures said. Well, what Scriptures is he talking about? Apostle Paul is talking about the Old Testament, in part, most of it. He's talking about the book of Isaiah, talking about Daniel. He's talking about um, the Psalms. And he's talking about the Scriptures that prophesied over 500 prophecies pertaining to the coming, the death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. In fact, you can read Psalm 22. It's an amazing description of what took place on the cross. Perhaps one of the most dramatic passages in Scripture is found in Isaiah 53. It's as if a reporter was there taking notes of what took place. It's absolutely astounding. In fact, my father, I hope is watching, uh, my mom and father, my mom and father, my mom and dad, uh, my dad was a pastor and still is, and, and uh, we had a person that we became friends with who was Jewish, a very successful Jewish businessman. And his wife came to faith. He says, you know, I don't believe this thing about Christianity. If you can prove by the Old Testament that Jesus is the Messiah, I'll believe. But you've got to prove, and that opened the New Testament. So my dad took six months with him. After six months, he was convinced that Jesus was and is. Gave his life to Christ, became a pastor. He's a dear friend of the family. I have to bring him here and introduce him to him sometime. A great guy was my old youth pastor as well. So it's, uh, you know, it's just a really neat story and how that worked out. Incidentally, it kind of reminds me of Kip and Shyla. Uh, he was like, kind of like that kind of person, a great family man and just had a part, a love for God. And he learned, and he learned from the Old Testament that Jesus was. And so when the apostle Paul says that uh, I pass on to you which is most important and that Christ died for our sins as scriptures said, then we continue on verse 4. Scriptures say they also had some, there were some writings going around at that time that were considered scripture. And later on, uh, Peter even called Paul's writing scripture. So let's continue. He was buried and he was raised from the dead on the third day, just as the scripture said. Next verse, please, guys. He was seen by Peter and then by the twelve. After that, he was seen by more than 500 followers at one time. Most of them still alive. Not now, of course, but back then. Though some have died. And that's an amazing thing. Not only was this something that took place about 18 to 20 years ago, but there were people that actually saw Jesus, actually experienced what took place in the culture of Jerusalem, saw the, what took place. And they're still alive and still testifying. And the amazing thing, there's over 500 people. We have over 300 people in this room probably right now. Now, imagine if I had the ability to make you see a mirage. If I made something up and had all of you see it all at once and you believed it, that's kind of hard to believe. If I somehow would hypnotize all of you to believe that, yet there was 500 witnesses about Jesus Christ. And an also an amazing thing as well is who Jesus witnessed his first person he went to see after 
he rose again from the dead is astounding. And so we'll talk about that in a few moments. But he was seen by over 500 followers at one time, most of who were still alive. Then he was seen by James and later by the apostles. Last of all, though I had been born at the wrong time, I also saw him. For I am the least of the apostles. In fact, I'm not even worthy to be called an apostle after the way I persecuted God's church. But whatever I am now, it is all because God poured out his special favor on me and without result, not without results. Listen to this. For I worked harder than any of the apostles. I'm sure the other guys are saying, hey, Paul, watch it. But he didn't say it out of arrogance. He said it out of truth. For I worked harder than any of the apostles, yet it was not I, but God was working through me by his grace. You see, God wants us to be confident people. We all want to be confident. But when we try to muster up our confidence in ourselves, it's kind of short-sighted. It's like a balloon inflated. But when our confidence is on Jesus Christ and who he is and who we are through him, you can be confident. You can boast. You can be strong. There's no reason for us to be wimpy or, oh, I'm just a Christian. No, we should be really bold. We should be very confident because we know who we are in Christ. When you're built upon that, that's a confidence that cannot be shaken. And that's what the Apostle Paul is talking about. So it makes no difference whether I preach or they preach. For we all preach the same message you have already believed. But tell me this. Since we preach that Christ rose from the dead, why are some of you saying there'll be no resurrection of the dead? For if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, then all of our preaching is useless and your faith is useless. He's basically saying, if you all don't understand that if you're in Christ, you rise from the dead, then Christ didn't die. You see, there's a great correlation between Christ rising from the dead, and I, we'll get into it in a few moments. He said, if you do not do that, then your, your faith is dead. And we apostles should be lying, and, and we apostles would all be lying about God, for we have said that God raised Christ from the grave, but that can't be true if there's no resurrection of the dead. Now, some of you are saying, the pastor's amazing. He has all that scripture memorized. No, I'm looking at the screen. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. You feel a little better about yourself now, don't you? Okay. And if there's no resurrection of the dead, then Christ has not been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then your faith is useless. You are still guilty of your sins. In that case, all who have died believing in Christ are lost. And if our hope in Christ is only for this life, we are more to be pitied than anyone else in the world. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. So he's basically saying this. Listen, if Christ didn't raise from the dead, you might as well eat, drink, be married, for tomorrow we die. Why bother to live a lie? You know, I like the tooth fairy. I think it's a good idea. I don't like them now. I don't want to lose my teeth. But when I was smaller, I loved the tooth fairy. I would I want to yank that thing out and put it underneath my pillow, and the next morning there'd be a dollar bill. Today, I guess for interest, it'd probably be about a $100 bill, right? But anyhow, <laughs> and so I used to like to believe in all that. I like the tooth fairy and like all that kind of cool stuff. I wanted to believe it. But it wasn't true. So if it wasn't true, why do you want to believe a lie? And so the Bible says here, but if Christ has not been raised, he is, excuse me, and, but in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. He's the first in the great harvest of all who died. So you see, just as death came into the world through a man, now the resurrection from the dead has begun through another man. Just as everyone dies because we all belong to Adam, everyone who belongs to Christ will be given new life. But there is an order to this resurrection. Christ was raised as the first of the harvest. Then all who belong to Christ will be raised when he comes back. After that end will come. Let me explain a couple things to you. We mentioned the fact that over 500 people had a visual uh, encounter with Jesus Christ after he rose again from the dead. People say, well, how do you know he rose from the dead? From the dead? He just made it up. And first of all, you know, Jesus is just a great moral teacher. C.S. Lewis is one of my favorite authors. Uh, he came from Oxford University, was an atheist, and then became a believer. He wrote a great book called Mere Christianity, which is a great read. I highly recommend it. This is what he said about Christianity. He says, you know, Christianity, a lot of people say that Jesus was a great moral teacher. He said, a great moral teacher 
Uh, he's not a great moral teacher. He never claimed to be a great moral teacher. He claimed to be God. People said, no, he didn't claim to be God. Listen, he absolutely claimed to be God. They would have never killed Jesus if he didn't claim to be God. He claimed to be God. He said, I am, which is basically saying, I am God. And because of that, the Jewish people thought it was blasphemy, and they, they, they actually wanted to have him killed. They couldn't do it because of the Roman law at the time, they had, because they're under Roman subjugation. So they had to go to Pontius Pilate, and Pontius Pilate had to give the, uh, the A-OK to do that. He didn't want to do it. He wanted to release Barabbas, who was a known criminal. And he said, no, we don't want Barabbas. We want Jesus. So as a result of that, they killed Jesus. The reason why they killed Jesus is because he said he was God. Undeniable, he said that. He would have never been crucified if he didn't say that. So the apostle, I mean, C.S. Lewis says the following. He says, you know, he's, he didn't say he was a great moral teacher. So anyone says that, it's only a couple different options. One, he was a lunatic. He was out of his mind. Someone who says, I'm a poached egg, I'm quoting him. He's either out of his mind. Number two, he's a liar, deceitful. He's going around, and he knows this. He's a charlatan. He's a liar. He's trying to start, trying to make money, trying to buy a jet for himself and all that. He's just a, he's just a liar. Or the third thing is he's Lord. He is who he says he is. You don't have the option to say he's a great moral teacher because Jesus never said he was. My friends, he's not just a great moral teacher. A great moral teacher would not lie about himself. I mean, a great moral teacher wouldn't say, I'm God, would they? So when someone says, you know, he, no, he's not a great moral teacher. He's either God, a liar, or a lunatic, or he's Lord. You can't say he's anything else than that. So you need to choose to say who you say he is. I think it's a really truth in that, and you look at that. But the question remains, well, how do we know that Jesus really rose again from the dead? There's different theories about it. Obviously, they don't have time to go into all the different theories, but there's several that are out there. One theory is called the swoon theory. Well, basically, Christ, uh, what happened was he was beat up, 39 lashes, and the Bible talks about it, and even medical examiners today, when they read a description of what happened to Christ, they talked about what happened to him, talked about the clot and the blood mixing with the water in his body and all that. It's an amazing thing. But he went through all that suffering. And so they believe that he kind of uh, passed out, was in a comatose state, his heart rate went down. And he got into the tomb at night and said, okay, I'm getting out of here. And his disciples in hand, they pushed it away. And he went around and showed himself to a couple of people. And then he ended up dying. This is what they say. It's called the swim theory. But the likelihood of Jesus being able to get up after that beating and to remove that stone, it's just highly unlikely. Especially to show himself to 500 people after that. And especially these people that ran away. So that's one thing. So that's called the swoon theory. And another theory is that the disciples stole his body. They just stole his body. Well, that was the case. They'd say, well, they stole his body. So um, there's no Jesus. But there is evidence. There was, in fact, the apostle Paul later on in Acts 26, which is a narrative, which is a narrative of what took place in the early church, talks about the apostle Paul that was, meet, that was being tried for his crimes. He was talking to Festus, who was a governor in the area. And the Apostle Paul, you can look at it later on, shared his story and how he persecuted the church and how he went from town to town and how he was on his way to Damascus and how he had an encounter with God. And, and, he, and he said, you know, Festus said, hey, Paul, you're so brain, you're so smart, you're gone mad. He said, hey, Festus, King Agrippa, he's right there, King Agrippa, you know what I'm talking about. This stuff happened, didn't it? And he goes, yeah, it sure did. This stuff happened. I mean, people said they saw Christ and all that kind of thing. I'm not just making this up. So there was evidence. There, there was people that literally saw Christ, and they, they were literally willing to die and lay down their lives for him. So, you know, when you look at that, he's either a lord, lunatic, or liar. You have to choose who he is. But don't just say he's a great moral teacher. It's just not a thing. He's not a great moral teacher if, if he's not lord. In fact, the best thing we should do is just close up shop and go home. And so that's, this is part of the issue that the Bible talks about. And very interesting as well, as we look about Christianity, if I'm going to make up a story about Jesus coming back from the dead, why would I choose the worst witnesses possible? Do you know the first person that saw Jesus was a woman by the name of Mary Magdalene. The Bible says she had seven demons in her. You're probably saying, that's my, that's my mother-in-law. No, it wasn't your mother-in-law. She had seven demons in her. And Jesus cast him out. Church tradition says she was a prostitute. She was not a person of, 
uh, uh, to be trusted. And, 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 and if you, by the way, back in that day, if you were in a court of law and a woman was there, her testimony would have no valid, it would not be valid. So why on earth, if you're going to make up a story about, why would you choose a woman who was formerly possessed by demons and probably a prostitute? That's just stupid. Why would you do that? You'd want to find someone with more credible evidence, right? So that's the first thing, and so it's amazing. And there's something else about that that's amazing. We'll get into it later on. How wonderful is that? That Jesus goes to the people who are considered the dregs of society. He goes down to what we would consider the lowest common denominator, or even lower than that. And he goes to a former demon-possessed woman, and he shows himself to her first, not to the men, but to a woman. Glorious Salem has nothing on Jesus Christ. The greatest woman liberator that ever was was Jesus, who gave value and dignity to this woman and all the women that would travel around him. So here she is at the tomb. He didn't even go to the Father yet. He stopped by to say hi to her. That, to me, is amazing, which shows me how ridiculous would it be to make a, such a foolish story like that if it, if it wasn't true. It doesn't make any sense. Another thing that's amazing as well to me is when Christ was on the cross. There was a Roman centurion there, and that what they tried to do is keep peace. The Jewish people were known to cause all kind of a ruckus, and so the Romans put a, uh, a, special, a special military unit base right next to the Temple Mount. So they had a Roman centurion who, who's over 80 to 100 soldiers, and he's sitting there making sure there's peace at the cross, and he's watching this. He hears Jesus says, Father, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. He sees how he's treating him. So he's asking uh, John to take care of his mother. I mean, he says, wow. And when he died, and when there was an earthquake, and when the, uh, scar, the uh, sky went black, he said, surely he was the son of man. Well, why would you talk about a hated Roman to be one of the witnesses as well about being God? It just does not make sense. But what something is so amazing about this whole thing is why. Why? The Bible says, as one man sinned, in, in 1 Corinthians 15, Adam was the man that sinned, so Christ came. What is this supposed to mean? I mean, Adam and Eve. You actually believe in Adam and Eve? Come on, let's, let's be serious here. Well, I'm not going to get to all that right now, but there was a first person called Adam who was the beginning of civilization, the genetic code you and I all share, by the way. And people say to me, you know, it doesn't seem fair. Why would God punish all of humanity because of one man's sin? It's not fair. In which I said the same thing in fourth grade. When the little Johnny was joking and we all lost recess because of Johnny. Of course, I did it a number of times too, but that is beside the point. It doesn't seem fair. It's not fair, I told my teacher. Well, I don't care if it's fair. You're not going to recess because you're all, you're all accountable to each other. Doesn't seem fair. And so why would God punish humanity? Because one guy messed it up. If that's God, I want nothing to do with him. Let me, let me challenge you this morning about something. How many of you ever heard of the Gallup poll? Zogby poll. Pew Research poll. Or my favorite, Quinnipiac poll. My wife is an alumnus from there. These are reputable polling firms. They take scientific samples. It's absolutely amazing the accuracy of how they can take a snapshot of our culture at any given moment and be fairly accurate. In fact, a couple of elections ago, you know, even in the last presidential election, they, they predicted it. They were like two or three points off between Barack Obama and Mitt Romney. They were right on the money. Well, how do they do that? Because there's a science that there is a collective of humanity at any time, that a society does have a personality. And so, these people that get all upset how the Bible can, can just wipe everyone out because of one man, well, why do you listen to a poll then? That poll's not fair either, is it? Well, that's different. Well, is it really different? God took a poll through Adam. It's called the Adam poll. And Adam showed that humanity would not be able to sustain what God has offered us to do. In fact, another thing the Bible teaches about is authority and consequences for those under authority. Because Adam sinned, and because we're, humanity was polled by Adam, he was a poll case. He was like a Zogby poll. We call it the, I'm going to call it the Adam poll. And so as a result of his actions, all humanity 
was cursed by sin. Now, the wonderful thing is this. Just as one man sinned and came to sin, so one man came to save humanity. The second Adam got it right, and that was Jesus Christ. It is Jesus Christ. Isn't that amazing? I think it is. Isn't it amazing how God did that? And we said, well, why would God do such a thing? You know, why can't God just forgive everybody? Well, why is there a place called heaven and hell? And I don't believe in that. That's mythical. Why would God allow such a thing? And why would God do such a thing? And why can't God just forgive everybody? Because, you know what? Because God's a God of love. And love has justice. If someone comes in to a nursery or nursing home and starts doing vandalism or starts kidnapping people that can't fend themselves. What happens to you? Something rises up. Something's got to be done. It's called justice. It's called, it's an attribute of love. God's a just God. And God's a perfect God. He, he needs to have perfection. Without perfection, you cannot see God. There had to be a bridge. Now, I heard a story a number of years ago about these two guys that grew up together in the, in the, in the neighborhood. And they used to play together and play bikes and baseball and football the whole nine yards. And they grew up together, good friends and Later on, they got into high school, and one got really studious. It's an honor society. And the other guy got in trouble, started hanging out with the wrong people, started drinking, drugging, the whole nine yards, started becoming a, a common thief. Well, the other guy went into uh, college, and he went to law school, became a lawyer, then became a judge. And 30 years went on, 25 years later, he's there, and he's in a court of law, and there's his, is that Johnny? I keep using Johnny, I'm sorry. But here comes little Johnny there, who's not little anymore. He's a criminal. He's stolen over $10,000. He didn't have the money. He's poor. The judge is a, as a man of justice. There had to be justice. So he says, you owe $10,000 or oh, you're going on the slammer for until you pay it. So the, the court stops. The, the judge goes behind his chambers, puts his street clothes on, and calls Johnny into his office. Pulls into his side coat pocket, pulls out a checkbook, and writes a check for $10,000 to the court to pay his fee so he can be free. That's what God has done for us by the person of Jesus Christ. He's written a check for us because he loves us, because we all deserve death. And it's so wonderful. I am so glad because you know what, guys? I'm not really good at following rules and regulations. I try the best I can. But you and I cannot make ourselves right before God. I imagine, if you will, there was a scale on this floor from the bottom here to the top. And let's say you have Charles Manson, who's about here, being the dregs of society. You have Mother Teresa here. I'm probably about here. But the problem is, you know what the limit is? The scale? Pull the roof off and go up to the heavens forever. If I were to drive you to Long Island at Jones Beach, where I used to live in that area, and I said, okay, we're going to swim to England. Just going to swim. How many of you would be able to swim to England? No one could do that. You see, it's impossible for us to save ourselves. For the Bible says the wages of sin is death, but the gift of Jesus Christ is eternal life. And so there was, there was a sin, and there had to be payment for that, and Christ came for that. Why? Because God loves us. The fact that you're alive today shows that God loves you. Not only loves you, but he has a purpose, and he has a reason why you're alive. No one's alive just by happenstance. But there's going to come a day where there's going to be an accounting and you can come and say, I did everything great. And God's going to say, I'm sorry, it's not good enough. Only by accepting a check of Jesus Christ can you have it. I heard a story a number of years ago about a train operator that worked a drawbridge over a, over a stream, over, I'm sorry, a lake, or a river, excuse me, a river. And uh, he loved it. He had a little boy. He loved his little boy. And his boy loved to watch the train, like every little train. I, I, I still like Thomas the train. I'll, I'll, I'll admit it. I like Thomas the train, so if you ever hear me get upset, I say, you're causing confusion and delay. So I'm sorry. For those of you who have little kids, you know what I'm talking about. But kids love trains. And uh, so what happened was, this little boy used to come on his lap. He used to watch the drawbridge go down. The train would go across. Well, one day he got busy, so busy he got distracted. His little boy got out. His little boy ended up going down by the tracks and got into the, by the gears. All of a sudden, he heard uh, a sound of a horn. He saw a train was coming. The express train was coming with hundreds of people. He had only a moment to think, what am I going to do? If I go down and get my son, hundreds of people will lose their life. If I close the drawbridge, I'll save the hundreds of people, I'll lose my son. And so, regrettably so, he pulled the lever. The drawbridge went down and crushed his son to death, and the train crossed over and saved the people. 
And friends, that's kind of what Jesus, God did for us through Jesus Christ. He loved us so much. The Bible says, for God so loved the world that he didn't take, he gave. What did he give? The best thing he could give, his own son. That whoever believes in him will not die, but have eternal life. For God did not come to condemn the world, but to save the world. If God wanted to condemn the world, he would have done it already. But he wants to give everyone an opportunity. The Lord's not slow about his coming, he says in 1 Peter. But he wants none to perish. He wants you to come to know Christ. This is not some fable. This is not some mythical thing. This is the truth. Heard a story back in World War II. During World War II, there was a Jewish woman in France that was running from the Gestapo. And they were just totally overran the town. And there's nowhere to hide. This Jewish woman ran to a woman's house. This was an older widow lady who was a believer in Jesus Christ, a Christian. She says, please hide me. Please hide me. She says, listen, there's nothing we can really do. The tanks are coming. The regiments are coming. They're going to find us. Please help me. Please tell you what I want you to do. I'm going to give you my identification card. You give me yours. No, no. How can you do that? No, I want to do that. Why? Why? Well, listen, I know who I am in Christ. I know where I'm going when I die. This is not the end for me. But I want you to live because you're young and you have a future. So she gave her identification card to the Jewish woman that said she was not Jewish. And the other woman took the identification card as Jewish. This is a true story. She was round up, put in a concentration camp, and the, Jew, and, and the woman, the widow woman, died. The Jewish woman got free, eventually migrated, and came to Brooklyn, New York, and became a believer. And has shared that story all of her life. My friends, that's what Christ did for us. He took upon our identity and gave us his. Let's pray. Father, I want to thank you so much for what you've done in our lives. I thank you for what you've done through the cross. I thank you, Father, that you believe in us so much that you sent Jesus to die for us. Lord, I ask as we remaining moments of this service, I pray, Lord, this is, a, this is an important time. I pray that you would just speak to our hearts as we remember what you did in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to conclude with a couple other thoughts for, the, for those of you that are here today. For those of you that know about Christ and believe in Christ, this is good news for you. Do you know that Bible says that in Christ you are a new creation? Behold, all things have passed away. All things are new. Maybe on your way here this morning, you got in an argument. Maybe this morning you blew it. Maybe you blew it this past weekend. But know this, if you confess your sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us your sins. And if you give your life to Christ, he'll forgive you of all of your sins. There's something else as well I want to let you know, that you are a new creation in Christ Jesus. The old has passed away. God can cut and get into your DNA and change who you are. You're stupid. You never, no, whatever anyone's ever said to you, you never amount to anything. You're going to be this one. No, that's not true. Because through Christ, we are a new creation. You need to start believing that. That Christ rose again from the dead and gives us life. So understand that. Christ cares about the, un the, the forgotten ones. He cares about the woman that was cast out, seven demons. He cares about the Roman centurion who was hated. He cares about you. He cares about me. And he wants a place with you. One of the things we've done, uh, I like to start doing, uh, if I can, is to take a survey today. And the reason I'm doing this for, because I recognize the fact that not everyone comes to church every week. But on Sunday, we have the, probably the most amount of people all come at once, so, which is a good thing. So what we want to be able to do is have a little survey. We want to have a series called, um, You Asked For It. So we're going to preach about some topics you're interested in based upon that. We're also a growing church, and we're looking to go to another service sometime in the near future. In order to do that, we're trying to find some better times that would work with everyone else. And then finally, there's another part of the survey. I'm going to ask you to fill this out. I'm going to ask everyone, if you could be so kind. There's a pen in the basket. There's a pen in the pocket. I'm going to ask everyone to fill this out, if you'd be so kind. I'm going to ask you also a concluding survey question. And I want to ask you to be honest, because I want to pray for you. We're going to pray over these cards. And the question I want to ask you is this. There's about, there's about four answers I'm going to ask you to think about today. The first one is this. A, I'm a believer and follower of Jesus Christ. I believe in Jesus Christ. I'm a follower. I believe it. I'm living it. The second thing is this. If you believe that, put down A. Put it in over here which says uh, questions and comments. Put A there if that's you. If you're B, say, I believe in Jesus, but I'm not ready to give my life to him yet. I know he's real. But I'm 19, I'm 25, I want to do what I want to do for a while, and then 
you know, I'll kind of swing around when I get a little older. But right now, I want to sow some wild oats and pray for crop failure. If that's you, you know it's the truth. You come to church, but you're not willing to let go. You're not willing to say no to the bottle. You're not willing to say no to that relationship that's improper. You're not willing to say no to the business practices that are not they're dishonest. And you know you haven't given all to Christ. And by the way, if you haven't given all to Christ, you haven't given anything. God gave everything he requires the same back. So maybe that's you today. I believe in Christ, but I'm not ready to do it yet because I want to, I, I'm not ready yet. I want to, but I, I, or how about C? This is where I was for a period of time. I want to believe, but I got questions. How could a loving God take my grandmother from cancer? How could a loving God allow the ethnic cleansing that takes place in society? How could a loving God, I don't know if I understand this. I, I want to believe, but I got to know for sure. And if that's you, that's great. You know why the Bible says, if you will search with me with all your heart, you will find me. If you really want to know God, he'll show himself to you. I, we'd be happy to, to meet with you and talk to you, even, even start a class if necessary, or, or, or I'll even meet with you over a cup of coffee or something. And I'll be happy to talk to you about it. I'm not threatened by it. We believe that Jesus is real. And so if you've got questions... We'll be happy to explore them with you. If you're interested in that, please put that down. That would be uh, C. Or perhaps you're D. I don't care. I got dragged here by my wife, my husband, my parents. And I just came just to appease them so I can go and get something to eat. If that's you, that's fine too. But know this. One day you're going to give an answer about your life. And are you ready to face God today? I'll let you know something that's absolutely true. Every person at the sound of my voice, watching online, watching later on, everyone can be an incredible overcomer and winner. Everyone in Christ eventually wins. You might lose some battles, but we win the war. If you are in Christ, the best days are ahead, and you are a winner. All of you are winners. No losers in the kingdom of heaven. But do you want to give your life to Christ? I'm going to pray a prayer right now. If you want to pray it uh, with the quietness of your heart, you can. It could be a new beginning. And before we do that, we also give it time to, to have our tithes and our offerings. We're going to put these um, envelopes in the uh, offering boxes or the receptacles or the baskets we'll pass around. Part of what we do here at Cornerstone Church, if you're a guest, don't feel obligated. This is for tithes and offerings. We believe in tithes and giving back to the Lord what's His. The Bible talks about that. So, Father, I just pray that you bless these tithes and these offerings today. As we give back to you, which really yours anyhow, in Jesus' name. Lord, I pray you would further the gospel through this, that we would see more people come to know who they are and discover the pattern and passion of why they're alive in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's go ahead and do that. And so if you could be so kind to put those cards in so we can take a survey and know what's going on. And I'm going to ask Esteban if he'd be so kind to lead us in a closing song. And as we do that, we also want to open the area here, this, the front. This is the front area. Uh, we're going to have some of our prayer team make their way up. If you want prayer, we want to be able to pray with you and say, you know what, let's pray for you. As you leave today, you're welcome to uh, have a cup of coffee. You're welcome to take a Bible on the desk. We're just so glad you're here. And we believe God has you here for a reason. And this is a church that believes in Jesus Christ. This is a church that's interested in people coming to know Christ and becoming what he's called us to become so we can change our families, our communities, and yes, the world. We believe that because we serve a risen Savior. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, I ask you right now, I believe you are the Son of God. I ask you to forgive me of all of my sins, both known and unknown. And I choose this day to follow you. I declare that you are God. I am not God. I surrender my life. Every part of my life, I'm holding nothing back. Take it. It's yours. I'll give my life to you today. Now fill me with your spirit and give me the strength to walk the path that you've called me to walk in Jesus name amen if you prayed that prayer that's the most important prayer you've ever prayed let's all stand if we could let's have a closing song I step on forever he is glorified
Lord bless you and keep you. Happy Easter, happy Resurrection Day. Let's walk in his life and his love today. You're dismissed. God bless you.